Dr. Perlmutter. Oh, good to see you. Good James. to see you again. So, uh, Doc, we're about to uh, have your talk here on the uh, the microbiome, and um, tell us a little bit about what the uh, audience can expect. Sure. So it's beyond the microbiome. What we're really interested in, in talking about today is what makes health and even looking at disease processes similar. Why are things, what are the broad strokes? And in that we're looking at the broad strokes in terms of diet, in terms of other lifestyle factors, but as James mentioned, through the lens of this hundred trillion organisms that live within us. So really trying to tease apart the idea that, well, there's a, a heart smart diet and a brain smart diet and a diet to keep your bones nice and strong and maybe a diet to help prevent your risk of, or lower your risk of cancer and reduce your risk of diabetes turns out that we know what the broad strokes are in terms of dietary and lifestyle recommendations, but we're looking at those uh, issues now through the lens of the microbiome. In other words, how do our lifestyle choices affect the microbiome, and thereafter, how does that microbiome do its thing to keep us healthy? You know, I really enjoyed the talk, and it's funny listening to a neurologist speaking about type 2 diabetes and other issues that a top of neurologist wouldn't talk about. What is it about what you've learned that makes the microbiome such an amazing vantage to be able to make impact in all those other diseases? Well, we know that the microbiome affects things like inflammation, the set point of immunity, uh, produces various uh, chemicals that are important uh, for brain function, for brain protection. Uh, and so really exercises a huge amount of control over so many of our body's most fundamental processes. And we're just beginning to get our arms around that and beginning to understand that we can leverage this information and create a better internal environment as it relates to brain health and general health. Great. Well, we are thrilled to bring Dr. David Perlmutter to you on the Functional Forum. Uh, we're excited to bring you a lot of his talk. We'll have more of it for you. Check out the show and take it away, Dr. David Perlmutter. Medicine has splitters and groupers. And what do I mean by that? Well, splitters uh, is really this reductionist mentality of looking at diseases in their most um, unique states and trying to develop through, again, reductionist mentality, specific treatments for specific illnesses. Hence, we have the ICD-10 now, the ICD-10 coding that we all use in our offices. And just to give you a sense about what this is all about, there are now 68,000 disease codes in the ICD-10. Think about that. And I just wanted, since I've been given five extra minutes today, just to look at a couple of these to show you, uh, you know, some information I think is really rel very important. Uh, this is one of my favorite codes, V9107XA. We live in Florida, so we actually see a lot of this. This is a burn due to water skis on fire initial encounter. <laughs> now, I'm not making this up. So this is initial encounter. I mean, there's got to be a follow-up code. Uh, my next uh, favorite is 5612XA. Uh, we see actually not so much of this. This is struck by a sea lion initial encounter. <laughs> and then, of course, 6162XA. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Struck by a duck initial encounter. Amazingly, I am not making this up. If you look in your ICD-10 manuals, you will see these codes. Who petitioned? You know, you wonder why healthcare is so expensive in America is because that somebody's job was to get this into the ICD-10. Well, then we have groupers. So that's these are people who split things into finer and finer categories. Then we have what are called grouper. Now, again, I live in Florida, and when you say grouper, that's what people are thinking about. <laughs> That's how we catch grouper. We, it's, it's called straight hooking. But in reality, my mission is to look at how things are similar as opposed to how they differ. And that is to say, I'd like to really spend the next uh, four and a half hours with you talking about the, the broad strokes. What are the similarities between these disease processes? Dr. Merrill talked about uh, the notion that now chronic degenerative conditions are the number one health concern on the planet, even in third world countries. It's not infectious disease. It's not Zika virus, though. You know, you watch the news at night and another 12 or 17 cases in Florida just happened, so, you know, the world's coming to an end. But the reality is that we're being crippled by chronic degenerative read inflammatory conditions. And my mission really is to, is to look at that, uh, that notion 
but to look at it through the, the, the lens of the microbiome. Now, my challenge today was uh, by the uh, Integrative Healthcare Symposium team is to talk about the role of microbial diversity as it relates to our health and risk for disease. So we're going to focus on that. But I want to make it a bigger issue for us all to, to recognize that, in fact, we don't just need to be concerned about the microbiome living within us. You know, that's sort of an anthropocentric uh, mentality that, that science generally takes. Well, how, what does it have to do with me? We have to understand that uh, there are researchers around the world who are looking, for example, at the microbiome of the oceans. The ocean is very, very rich with uh, microbial uh, organisms and microbial diversity and in fact the health of the planet depends upon this diversity of organisms living within the oceans and this is a research study that shows the, the various areas that they uh, studied and found uh, some very interesting things that in fact when you look and compare the uh, intestinal microbiome with the uh, microbiome of the ocean the gut is an anaerobic environment it is a, a fairly constant temperature and, for example, isn't exposed to sunlight as opposed to the ocean. The sun shines at least on the upper portion of it. It's an aerobic environment and there's a highly, highly variable temperature going from uh, extremes of uh, temperature uh, in these vents that are down in, in, in great depths to, you know, obviously uh, freezing. But yet, there is a 73% concordance rate functionally of the organisms that live in the ocean in comparison to what are living in your body right now. And that's really a remarkable consideration, isn't it? To think that, you know, we, we consider that bacteria and organisms living within us have evolved to take up residence within us, but actually the organisms are, are very much shared with what is found in the ocean. The organisms living within us have the genes for photosynthesis. Now, uh, most of us don't have a lot of sunlight shining within our colons most of the time. But, <laughs> you know, isn't that where they get the, uh, they, that statement, well, let's put something where the sun don't shine. You've heard that. Um, and I just thought of that, too. Well, I didn't add that one in. <laughs> I'm multitasking here, writing jokes at the same time and giving a lecture. Oh, fun. And uh, amazingly, and that there are genes within the microbes living in the ocean for carbohydrate metabolism. Why would that be? So it's just interesting to consider that even from a mechanistic perspective, from a functional perspective, how much overlap there is. The fundamental way in which many microbes function has not changed in hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. So this evolution of these microbes that we like to think has finally characterized the human microbiome actually has its roots in the ocean from a long time ago. Let's talk about this relationship and really this great debt that we owe to, uh, to microorganisms. And this is um, the primordial Earth. And what happened a long, long time ago in a planet not so far away was that there was a mutation in these cyanobacteria where they suddenly developed chlorophyll. And that made all the difference in the world. Because at that point, we could develop an atmosphere that contained oxygen that would support our lives, that would support this, uh, this relationship, for example, that we have with our mitochondria, that allowed everything that we know in terms of living beings to, to arise. Oh, let me go back for just a moment. That's actually, uh, that was actually Florida, anyway. So all that goes on uh, around us in terms of the life we see really is, uh, owes a great debt to that simple mutation in those bacteria that allowed photosynthesis to occur. Well, my interest, of course, has been the brain and what goes on within the brain. And as I've spoken uh, at this uh, meeting over the years, um, and most of the time here in this actual, at this hotel, uh, I'm talking about energetics of the brain and free radical mediated pathology and how flaws of mitochondrial function ultimately lead to apoptosis or pre-programmed cell death. The brain is a highly energetic, energy demanding organism utilizing 25% of our calories at rest while it only represents 5% of our total body weight. 
When we look at that, we think mitochondria. And we, we think about this relationship that we have with these mitochondria and understand that mitochondria were very likely bacteria that took up residence in what would then be eukaryotic cells. I mean, this is a mitochondrion, but looks for all the world like a bacterium, doesn't it? Uh, Dr. Lynn Margulis talked about this way back in 1968, looking at mitochondria, looking at their circular DNA, which is like bacterial DNA. And, uh, you know, this is another relationship than we have if you consider mitochondria to have a microbial origin, then this is yet another player in the realm of our relationship, in the understanding of our relationship with microorganisms. Then we can look at the cosmos. We went to the uh, planetarium. You should really go to the Museum of Natural History here uh, yesterday, and, and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson narrates this incredible tour through the, through the cosmos. But you know, it's, it's true that we think of this incredible amount of information in the universe. And yet, uh, as uh, Julian Davis talks about, once the diversity of the microbial world is cataloged, it will make astronomy look like a pitiful science. I mean, that's a kind of a, a harsh uh, assessment. But the amount of information within the microbiome is incredibly, incredibly vast. These bacteria, you know, outnumber our, our own body cells by a factor of 10 to 1, but the microbes in and of themselves represent a vast repository of information. And, you know, recently that statistic of that the bacteria outnumber our own cells 10 to 1 was challenged. Somebody wrote something in it, so, of course, my email box got filled. Okay, there are 10 times as many phage particles as there are bacteria, so I can, I can regain my composure here and recognize, if you look at the microbes in general, that there are a lot of them. But let's talk about these mitochondria for just a moment. Again, very much looking like bacteria, and when we, this really spans then the spectrum. Looking at the cosmos and the vastness of the universe and the very smallest of organisms within our bodies, the phages, and of course, uh, looking at the microbiome. So, as I mentioned, Dr. Lynn Margulis, who in 1968 published this notion, she tried to publish it, and she was rejected 14 times by peer-reviewed journals. And finally, uh, Journal of Theoretical Biology decided it would publish it, take a chance, and they were right. But this notion that the mito mitochondria were once free-living organisms that took up residence within our cells, I mean, it was thought to be basically heretical uh, that someone would conceive of such a notion. And we think of uh, Dr. Margulis and what an achievement this has become in terms of how it's become recognized. And on the other side of the scale, when we think of the billions and billions of stars in the universe, of course, you always think of Carl Sagan, right? And how amazing that they were husband and wife. I mean, you talk about spanning uh, the cosmos and the microbial universe. Uh, quite, what would those dinner discussions have been about, you know? <laughs> She'd say, I was looking in the, under the microscope today, and he'd say, I bet there were billions and billions of mitochondria. And she'd say, yes, but I'm really getting tired of hearing that. But nonetheless, <laughs> I, I want to get back to the notion of grouping things and looking at the broad strokes. Because, you know, the idea that there's a heart-smart diet and then a different diet that you would need if you wanted to protect your brain. Oh, and I don't want to become diabetic and I don't want to have cancer. The idea that there would be a special diet for each of those things doesn't make sense at all. There has to be the broad strokes in terms of dietary recommendations that have allowed us to survive to get to this place today to have this conversation. I mean, two million years worth of survival allowed us to get here. So we, we have to understand that there are, that these diseases, for example, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, MS, stroke, depression, ADHD, the neurologic conditions, but well beyond that, the coronary artery disease, diabetes and cancer. We've encompassed a, a, a large percentage of the things that are crippling our society just with this one slide. We could go on and on. We could go back to the ICD-10 codes, and uh, I don't think water seas on fire would necessarily uh, qualify, but a lot of that book are gonna be conditions that are induced by our lifestyle choices. 
I hate to say it, but it puts, I hate to say blame, but I'm going to say it anyway. It puts the responsibility, let's say that, upon us to stay healthy because we don't have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease, none whatsoever, not even for the symptoms. We can manage the symptoms of Parkinson's tremor and rigidity, but we don't treat the underlying condition. There's nothing that treats autism. But we're going to look at that. MS, there are some disease modulating uh, uh, medicines that are out there. One of them is called vitamin D. People have strokes. It's an inflammatory condition. Uh, depression, you know, the effectiveness of the um, SSRI antidepressant medications are about maybe a, per a percentage or two above uh, the effectiveness of placebo. Uh, ADHD, yeah, you know, we load up our children with amphetamines, that's, a, that's reasonable. Coronary artery disease, diabetes and cancer. We're talking about prevention here, and we're talking about prevention through the lens of the hundred trillion friends that we have who want us to be healthy because we're giving them that wonderful, warm, wet, dark place to live, and they're really happy about, about their digs. So we have to look at these issues now through the lens of these micro, uh, our microbiota. So we understand that these commensal flora, I love the term commensal, co means with, mensa means eat. You know, they say when a woman is pregnant, oh, you've got to be careful now, you're eating for two. Well, you're each eating for a hundred trillion. <laughs> Think about that. Everything that you eat is either going to nurture or it's going to be damaging to your microbiome. And if it's damaging to your microbiome, guess what? It feeds back to your genome, it feeds back to your metabolism. I'm not sure where I go with this. Ah, yes. This came from this article. So what are the factors then that favor symbiosis? Getting along, living in, in symbiotic relationship with our gut bacteria. A diet that's high in fiber, specifically a diet that's high in prebiotic fiber. Um, uh, being born by natural birth, uh, passing through the birth canal, where we are anointed. I use the word. <laughs> We were, at the, uh, anyway, long story. We're, we are anointed with not just the bacterial organisms, but with their genetic information. We'll talk about that later. Breastfeeding, exposure to microbes, being, playing in the dirt, not being so obsessed with hygiene, uh, consumption of probiotics in our food, for example, and having favorable genetics, sets us up for this re wonderful relationship where we can resolve immunity, we can balance our immune system. Uh, we reestablish re bacterial integrity, uh, or rather barrier integrity, integrity of the epithelium, the one cell lining our intestines. We regulate neutrophil activity. We reduce uh, T helper cell uh, 17 activity and, and uh, we increase T reg, which helps to balance the immune system. And, uh, interleukin-10, which we'll talk about later on. But things that favor dysbiosis or this inappropriate relationship with our gut bacteria, using antibiotics, other medications, the antibiotics in our livestock. Obesity changes our gut bacteria and our gut bacteria increase risk of obesity. Our obsession with hygiene, the typical Western diet, very low in prebiotic fiber, stress, and of course pathogenic bacteria. This sets the stage for inflammation, uh, immune issues, and even cancer. Cancer is fundamentally an inflammatory condition. Thanks so much for watching, and for more great clips like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I've created a special free video just for you. It's called The Five Steps to Becoming a Leader in Your Wellness Community, and it'll give you some of the starting points on how to position yourself as the leader in your zip code of your health community. All you have to do is click on the link below.